In this lecture, we will be considering the causes of the war and the July crisis of 1914 as Europe plunged into the conflict. Fierce debate has surrounded the question of the causes of the war since the very event took place. In this lecture, we'll consider first the prehistory of growing tensions that led to the war. Next, we'll analyze the immediate events, uh, such as the assassination of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand at Sarajevo in June of 1914 that touched off a diplomatic chain reaction that produced the conflict itself. We'll weigh the dominant positions in the furious debates that have raged on the origins of the war, and we'll seek to understand better some of the issues at stake, who or what ultimately was responsible for the outbreak of the war. Now, clearly, in terms of the largest issues, an analysis of the causes of the First World War is existentially important. The very fact of how the great powers tipped over into a general war in 1914 is considered a classic case of escalation in diplomatic and military history, and thus it's very urgent to understand how it happened. Indeed, this is one of the most voluminous debates in all of historical scholarship, and many hundreds of books have been written on the topic. The debates center on many issues, which are key questions of historiography. The debates concern questions of whether long-term or short-term factors were more important, whether the role of individuals should be stressed, or whether rather structural factors took on greater importance, whether the policymakers who produced this disaster did so by intention, with malice aforethought, or whether miscalculation instead guided their steps. And questions also, ultimately, of whether culpability can be clearly assigned to one or another party or side, as opposed to a collective responsibility for this man-made disaster. We need, first of all, to understand some of the prehistory of these events, because 1914 and the crises of that year, in fact, built on earlier diplomatic history. German unification in 1871, Bismarck's German Revolution of unifying Germany into one imperial nation-state, had changed the balance of power. After this German revolution of German unification, Bismarck often sought through secret diplomacy to reinforce stability, to reassure Germany's neighbors, and to make Germany itself indispensable to European order. A key example of this was Bismarck's attempt to argue to the conservative powers of the continent, Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Russia, that they had shared interests. And in 1873, he crafted the Three Emperors League as an attempt to solidify that solidarity. But ultimately, it failed, in part because of conflicts between Austria, Hungary, and Russia. Bismarck then scaled back his ambitions and set up the so-called dual alliance, where Austria-Hungary joined Germany in an alliance relationship in 1879. When Italy joined as a third power in 1882, this became the so-called Triple Alliance. But at the same time, pursuing his canny diplomatic manipulations, Bismarck also kept open lines of communication with the conservative power of Russia by signing the secret reinsurance treaty of 1887, which promised that neither power would aid another power attacking either Germany or Russia. When Bismarck left office in 1890, essentially dismissed by the new fiery Kaiser Wilhelm II, this special German tie with Russia was dropped. In 1894, contrary to German expectations, Russia and France, in what amounted to a diplomatic bombshell, uh, announced that they had entered into a military alliance. This took German diplomats by surprise. Their expectations were that the political systems of both of these countries were so different that they wouldn't be able to be reliable alliance partners. Russia, after all, was an autocratic empire, France, by contrast, a republic. But as it turns out, their shared strategic interests overrode any domestic ideological differences. Now, in terms of the concept of the balance of power that we've discussed in earlier lectures, at this point, with the emergence of a French and Russian alliance, the most natural outcome would have been a balancing off of this alliance by a revitalized German-British relationship or friendship or alliance, which would have balanced off uh, against this constellation of powers. 
Uh, it says much about the disastrous miscalculations of German diplomacy that this didn't take place. By contrast, Britain uh, felt uh, that though the time was right for an alliance, uh, finding new partners, Germany was not a partner that came into question. Britain had grown worried about its own isolation at the start of the 20th century and had found allies, among them Japan, in 1902, but ultimately was worried about German intentions. When Wilhelm II, the Kaiser of Germany, announced a new aggressive foreign policy called Weltpolitik, or world policy, in 1897, which aimed to make Germany a, a world power, and began construction of a great fleet, the British were worried. In a warped sense, uh, Wilhelm uh, II had intended this building of a, of a super navy, in some sense, to make Germany more desirable to the British as an alliance partner uh, because uh, it would gain the respect of this maritime power. Uh, this was, again, a disastrous miscalculation because Britain instead grew worried about rivalry on the seas. So Britain then reacted by approaching its traditional enemy, France, and they settled their mutual colonial frictions in an agreement, not an alliance, not a formal alliance, from 1904 called the Entente Cordiale, the friendly relationship. Now, while this was not a formal alliance, further cooperation could certainly develop on the basis of this agreement. German diplomats worried about what they saw as an encirclement of enemy powers all around Germany, and thus they sought to provoke colonial crises that would fragment the alliances that they saw coalescing against them. The colonial crises over Morocco in 1905 and again in 1911, in fact, did just the opposite. They cemented French and British cooperation and increased general suspicions of Germany and its ambitions. Completing this web of relationships uh, and of uh, friendships of powers that worried about Germany uh, was in 1907 the understanding which Britain and Russia undertook in order to settle their colonial conflicts. So by 1907, a very key diplomatic moment had been arrived at. Throughout the European scene, increasingly rigid alliances covered the European continent. On the one hand, one had the Triple Alliance, Imperial Germany, Austria-Hungary, and Italy, though questions always remained about whether Italy could be trusted to ultimately uh, participate actively in the Triple Alliance. The Triple Alliance was balanced off by the opposing powers of the Triple Entente, France and Russia bound together in an alliance, and Britain bound to them through understandings or Entente's. Very clearly, the temperature was rising in terms of potential conflict in Europe. And nowhere more so than in the Balkan region. The Balkans, as we've already pointed out, was an area where, with the receding of the Ottoman Empire, a power vacuum had emerged, which presented a tremendously volatile political situation internationally. Uh, and such a keen diplomatic thinker and observer as the Iron Chancellor of Germany, Otto von Bismarck had worried about the Balkans. In a, one of the phrases that he just tossed off that later seemed to have almost a prophetic quality to them, Bismarck had worried that all of his careful undertakings to preserve European peace would be undone by, as he put it, some damn fool thing in the Balkans. And that was precisely what ended up happening in 1914. Uh, but in fact, a whole series of Balkan crises had preceded this ultimate Balkan crisis, and they hadn't produced general war. It's sometimes said by historians that World War I really represented the third Balkan War, one in a series which ultimately escalated into a worldwide conflict. How had that happened? As Ottoman control had receded in the course of the later 19th century, before the power of the uprising of nationalist independence movements in Balkan countries like Serbia, Bulgaria, and Romania, which became independent and clamored for more territory, this region had become a power vacuum. And it was one in particular in which both multinational empires, Austria-Hungary as well as Russia, got involved, feeling that their interests were implicated. In a very special sense, Austrian policymakers felt that the Balkans represented a special threat. 
Well, recall that Austria-Hungary, as a multinational, multi-ethnic construct with 12 major nationalities, felt especially threatened by the powers of nationalism. If nationalism truly came to the fore, the result would be that the empire itself might very well explode. And the anxieties focused on the Balkans of Austro-Hungarian leaders. They considered it imperative to impede the ambitions of Serbia in particular, because Serbian ambitions involved the creation of a South Slavic state with Serbs in a leadership position, feeling that they had a, uh, essentially a, a, a nationalist calling to achieve this Slavic unity. And the anxiety of Austro-Hungarian policymakers was precisely that their own South Slavic peoples, Croatians, Slovenes, Serbian minorities living uh, under the Habsburg rule, might feel the attractions of this pan-Slavic ideology and be drawn to its message. If that were to happen, the other nationalities of Austria-Hungary might very well peel off as well, and the empire itself would be destroyed. Uh, events clearly had taken a bad turn already in the so-called Bulgarian crisis of 1885, when Austria-Hungary and Russia had argued over who should have most influence in the Bulgarian state. Germany, forced to choose between its alliance partners, had uh, tried to steer a more neutral course, but was seen as supporting Austria-Hungary more. This led to Russian anger, a worsening of German-Russian relations, and the breakdown of Bismarck's conservative Three em Emperors League. There followed then an increase in tensions with the new 20th century, the Balkan Wars. In 1908, a crisis situation had developed in the Balkans when Austria annexed Bosnia-Herzegovina, an area which has been much in the news at the end of the 20th century and the start of the 21st. Austria-Hungary had administered this area since 1878, though it formally had remained under Ottoman rule, but now to, in part, demonstrate the vitality of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, had formally annexed the area. Serbia, which had also coveted that area, there were Serbians living there, was infuriated and prepared for conflict. When Germany supported Austria-Hungary, Serbia and its great patron to the east, Russia, felt that they were not ready for war, were humiliated and backed down. But both sides resolved that they would not compromise again. Wars then flared up in the Balkan area in 1912. A Balkan League, including Serbia, Bulgaria, Montenegro, and Greece, fought against the Ottoman Turks and expelled them from most of the Balkans and Europe, but then fell out themselves as allies over the spoils of their victory in the Second Balkan War of 1913, with most of the former allies ganging up to fight against Bulgaria. The outcome of the Second Balkan War was a remarkable one. Serbia had gained new confidence. Its size had doubled. Its confidence had grown in its sense of nationalist mission. But it still lacked access to the Adriatic. And the fact that Serbs in Bosnia had come under the rule of Austria-Hungary still rankled. These unresolved conflicts provided an explosive mixture which ultimately would help to produce the July crisis. The July crisis of 1914 began with a terrorist act. So in a very real sense, World War I began due to terrorism. Now obviously, other factors had come into play. Earlier assassinations or acts of terrorism had not led to world wars. This one was different. On June 28th, 1914, the heir to the Habsburg throne Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife, Sophie, were visiting the provincial capital of Bosnia-Herzegovina, Sarajevo. At 11.15 in the morning, they were both assassinated. The assassination itself uh, proceeded with uh, a, essentially a comedy of errors, though a dark comedy, as the gang of assassins failed in repeated attempts uh, to uh, destroy the uh, procession of the uh, royal couple. Uh, when, however, the car that was to take the uh, archduke and his wife away from the scene took a wrong turn, by chance, as luck would have it, uh, one final assassin saw his opportunity. He was very surprised to see the car unexpectedly loom up before him. He stepped up to it 
and fired into the car itself and assassinated the couple. The young assassin was an 18-year-old student, Gavrilo Princip, who was affiliated with a Serbian underground group called the Black Hand. Its motto was Union or Death, meaning union in a great South Slavic Serbian state, uh, or death, which he now had meted out. He was immediately arrested, and investigations followed as to how this could have happened. The assassination itself, contrary to the suspicions of the Austro-Hungarian government, had not been organized by Serbia's government itself, but it had been supported by shadowy, mysterious figures within that government, in particular the head of Serbian military intelligence, a Colonel Dragutin Dimitrievich, also known as Apis. The Sarajevo visit had coincided with a moment of nationalist fervor. It had as it happened, fallen on an anniversary, the Serbian nationalist anniversary of the defeat of the Battle of Kosovo of Serbian forces by the Ottoman Turks in 1389, and had been seen as a special provocation by the nationalists who had brought, brought off the assassination. Uh, outrage internationally spread at this cruel act, and uh, Gavrilo Princip, uh, who was taken to prison, was soon tried and spared the death penalty because of his youth. He eventually died of tuberculosis in prison in 1918 before the war ended. Now the Austro-Hungarian government proceeded to respond to what was seen as a provocation, a challenge to the very existence of Austria-Hungary as a great power. The Austro-Hungarian government used this tragedy as an opportunity to stage a long-awaited showdown with Serbia to finally settle the score. When Austro-Hungary inquired whether Germany would support vigorous action by the Habsburg Empire, the German leadership agreed, and it gave what later historians have called a blank check of support on July 5, 1914, even though it understood that the risk of general war was certainly present and might break out. On July 23rd, thus, a crucial diplomatic event took place. Austria-Hungary presented an ultimatum to Serbia, one that had been very carefully crafted to be unacceptable to the Serbian government. It was to be accepted by them, the ultimatum announced, within 48 hours. On July 25th, Serbia went the extra mile by accepting all but a few of those conditions, accepting those which interfered with or didn't uh, correspond to its national sovereignty, in particular the demand for an Austro-Hungarian commission of investigation traveling throughout Serbia to investigate what they felt was probably the complicity of the Serbian government. Nonetheless, in response to what it considered an unsatisfactory answer, on July 28th, Austria-Hungary declared war on Serbia. And now events began to unfold with tremendous rapidity. To support its Serbian ally, the Russians now came into play. Tsar Nicholas ordered full mobilization of Russia's armies on July 30th. The next day, on July 31st, Germany came to the support of its Austro-Hungarian ally. Germany sent to Russia an ultimatum that it had to stop its mobilization within 12 hours or face war. At this point, Events showed the importance of the detailed military planning and the rigid timetables which had been developed by general staffs in the years previous. Kaiser Wilhelm II, at this point, suggested, contrary to earlier plans, that perhaps one should not go to war in the West as well. His panicked generals almost experienced, by some accounts, a nervous breakdown at this and tearfully explained to the Kaiser that there were no other war plans. The war now proceeded and war was declared. On August 1st, Germany declared war on Russia. On August 2nd, in line with its earlier plans for a knockout victory in the West before moving east, Germany declared an ultimatum to Belgium that it must allow German troops to pass through its neutral territory on their way to attack France. Belgium refused. Great Britain, which had repeatedly throughout these crisis hours proposed mediation, or peace conferences, now communicated to Germany that if Belgian neutrality were violated, Britain would go to war. On August 3rd, Germany declared war on France, and on August 4th, invaded neutral Belgium, putting the long-ago crafted ideas of the Schlieffen Plan into action. 
On August 4th, Britain also entered the war. It did so officially for its commitment to respect the neutrality of Little Belgium, which had been guaranteed by the great powers in 1839. The German prime minister or chancellor, Bethmann Hollweg, told a horrified British ambassador that this neutrality was merely a scrap of paper. Nonetheless, Britain respected its obligations and also realistically in terms of power politics was concerned about the balance of power. It could not allow France to be crushed and for the channel to be dominated by German power. As many had suspected would happen, Italy did not honor its treaty obligations and instead stayed out of the war, tending to what it called its sacred egoism and defense of its own interests. Thus, by August 4th, 1914, this had become a general war such as Europe had not seen in the course of a century. At this point, the central powers, Imperial Germany and Austria-Hungary, the central powers, faced off against the allied powers, France, Great Britain, and Russia. The war now had become a general war. Debate continues to this very day about the causes of this conflict. And debate had begun with the war's start itself. Governments published so-called colored books claiming that their side was just, that they were reacting to aggression by the other side. Scholarly debates that have proceeded with, with ferocity in the years afterwards have seen enormous shifts since the war itself. One key formulation of an explanation of the causes of the war was provided by the Versailles Treaty. The Versailles Treaty at the end of the war, imposed upon a defeated Germany, uh, included Article 231, the so-called War Guild Clause, in which Germany was forced to accept sole responsibility, along with its allies, for launching the war. This clause was also intended to justify uh, the payment of reparations by the defeated side as well. But it provided a very clear answer. Germany accepted the responsibility for the war. However, in the next years, in the 1920s and the 1930s, uh, different interpretations instead became prominent, including the notion of collective responsibility. In the interwar years, as international tensions relaxed, as some of the passions of the war died down, opinions shifted instead towards the notion not of sole German responsibility, but instead of a shared responsibility by many irresponsible European politicians for this tragedy. And even British wartime leader David Lloyd George, about whom we'll be talking much more about his energetic leadership in the war, afterwards suggested that perhaps all European states had somehow inadvertently, as he put it, slithered over the edge into war. In the 1960s, however, debate grew once again. This is the famous Fisher debate. Renewed debate exploded in 1961 in particular when German historian Fritz Fischer published a book which in German uh, was entitled Grab for World Power. It had the weaker title in its English translation of Germany's Aims in the First World War. Um, Fischer's book argued that Germany had launched the war to become a superpower and developed war aims, which in many cases anticipated those of the Nazis in the Second World War. Furious confrontations followed, but in the process of the debate itself, positions changed. Even Fischer's harshest critics came to argue that while Germany had played a very important role in starting the war, it had miscalculated rather than intending a world war. Fischer's positions became more extreme with time. In a later book, he argued that Germany had planned the war years previously from 1912. Other explanations also were advanced by historians in the furious debates about the causes of the war. Did alliances themselves cause the war? Indeed, after the First World War itself, secret diplomacy was sometimes denounced as a crucial factor. Well, a diplomat like Bismarck had tended to believe, by contrast, that alliances and webs of networks and relationships made war less likely. Did arms races and military planning in all of its detail and inflexibility cause the war by forcing war by timetable? The diplomat and diplomatic historian Henry Kissinger has argued that alliances and mobilization plans created what amounted to a doomsday machine that moved Europe towards war. Was the war then an accident, as the provocative British historian A.J.P. Taylor argued? He proposed that politicians had been turned into the prisoners of their own weapons. Was this really the case? 
Was perhaps imperialism the cause, the scramble for colonies, the frictions that had grown over imperial competition? Well, while clearly colonial competition had certainly poisoned the atmosphere between the great powers, Germany and Austria-Hungary had been less prominent in such colonial competition, and earlier colonial clashes had indeed been negotiated peacefully. Was perhaps capitalism the cause, as Marxists and Marxist historians argued? On the contrary, the war would take an incredible economic toll, as we'll see in later lectures, and Germany's own industrial dominance had grown in peacetime, only to be frustrated in Europe as a whole by the ravages of the war. Uh, finally, there's a kind of explanation gets advanced, which is not really a scholarly theory, but I think nonetheless needs to be put out on the table. Some people feel that there's something about the Balkans themselves, the Balkanized, the word even is entered in the English language, the fragmented or Balkanized nationalist passions of the region that somehow made it a powder keg that blew up. Uh, this sort of not quite scholarly explanation uh, was hinted at also during the 1990s as Balkan wars raged there, in part as an excuse for not intervening. There was something about the Balkans, some suggested, that made those people kill one another and hate one another. Well, I think that this explanation needs to be looked at quite critically, because in fact, it wasn't only the Balkans themselves and the national, nationalist passions that reigned there, but indeed the outside involvement of great powers that was a crucial variable in bringing the, uh, the explosive situation to its flashpoint. Where do interpretations of the causes of the war stand today? Most scholars today do see Germany as bearing the main responsibility for the war. Germany was willing to risk a general war, though perhaps not aiming for it. Even as Germany is seen as mainly responsible, some degree of responsibility is seen by many historians as shared by other actors in this tragedy, uh, at least in the sense of not having tried hard enough to prevent a general war. Historians are currently focusing renewed attention on the role of Austria-Hungary as the beginning, the flashpoint of this conflict, as Austria-Hungary, in part as they saw it, to defend their own survival, initiated the process itself to cause a regional war, not desiring a general war as erupted, but a localized conflict that they felt would ensure the continued survival of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. In terms of the Fischer debate, many of Fischer's arguments about war aims and the extensive nature of German war aims have been accepted, but some of his more far-going claims about German intentions or premeditation have not been accepted. I think it's safe to say that the debate continues today and will continue into the future as well. But we might usefully add into our consideration of the causes of the war one more psychological element shared by many European politicians at this time uh, which is hard to quantify, hard to capture exactly, but which nonetheless must have sh uh, played a role. A shared sense of fatalism played an important role in the unfolding of these events. In addition to a misunderstanding of the true nature of modern war, Europe's political leaders, in some sense, by believing that a war was inevitable, helped to make that war inevitable if it had not already been so. The conviction that Europe was moving inevitably towards a great clash, a great general war, had something in the nature of a self-fulfilling prophecy. And I like to give one particular example of this that was tremendously evocative. The compulsion on the part of some politicians, some intellectuals, to think the unthinkable and to view the war, a coming war, as inevitable and perhaps even in some sense desirable at least to clear the air and to finally break the great tension, was expressed by a famous German saying that was much current at the time. And that saying went, in translation, better a terrible end than endless terror. Better a terrible end than endless terror. The argument was, in essence, that if the conflict was inevitable, better that it should come now and finally break the tension that had been building over previous years. Later, this saying, better a terrible end than endless terror, would take on a dreadful significance because contemporaries were about to discover that it wasn't an either-or proposition. In fact, in terms of the First World, War, First World War, one could very well have both. 
We'll examine next the intensity of illusions and misapprehensions and failed plans with which this terrible war would begin in our next lecture.